Adolf Hitler is determined to change the way German people think and feel. And he's doing so by creating a new Nazi form of art and culture. Culture was extraordinarily important to National Socialism. They wanted films, they wanted art, they wanted music that were consistent with Nazi ideology. Every artist must conform to Hitler's harsh and brutal vision. Hitler was obsessed with art and architecture to the point at which he burned books and delegitimized a whole artistic movement. Hitler was going to clean house, both in the domain of culture as he had done in the domain of politics. He is taking total control of radio and film. The Nazis are using culture to spread their propaganda, to win power, and prepare Germans for war. It's actually wonderfully subtle as a form of mind manipulation. They are creating an artistic dictatorship with no room for dissent. By controlling the media, the Nazis are converting the German people into willing, active participants in their evil regime, including mass murder. If you say my group represents the highest aspirations of humankind, and if anybody threatens my group, they threaten virtue, then I have a warrant for genocide. In 1913, Adolf Hitler is struggling to make a living. A self-taught artist, he sells his watercolors of Munich sites to the tourists, but he wants much more. His burning ambition is to become a great artist. Hitler grew up in provincial Austria, but moved to Vienna and tried to get into the Academy of Arts. Although he could paint and draw buildings, he was never any good at people. So he was turned down. And he was actually told, rather kindly, I think, by the examiners that he should be an architect. He didn't listen, he tried again, was rejected again. And his ambition to become an artist was not fulfilled. Hitler never forgets this painful rejection. His revenge is to transform German art, making his own image its most potent icon. Germany in the 1920s is in the middle of an artistic revolution. Defeat in the First World War causes political turmoil and a national identity crisis. The Nazis exploit the instability created by this growing cultural conflict. On one side are conservatives clinging to a precious German past they fear is under threat. Opposing them are modernists, open to experimental art, embracing foreign ideas and intoxicated by the new. Modernism was to some degree a revolution. The whole concept was to somehow reject history. A wave of modernism shakes up every form of art, challenging traditional beliefs and attitudes. There was a sense of revolution in the 20s, and that was expressed by artists, by poets, and inevitably, of course, by architects, because there was a belief that there should be a new architecture for a new society. The German people are used to very traditional architecture. There is uh, a huge amount, actually, of pastiche medievalism. The fondness for pitch roofs is a straight harking back to the German past. But in 1927, the modernist revolution strikes Stuttgart. The city's housing problem demands a bold solution. So the authorities commission young, avant-garde architects from across Europe to design 33 new buildings. The result is a radical flagship for modernist architecture, the Weisenhof Estate. 
It was the first exhibition of construction and architecture which was intended for long-term residential use. Usually, these show homes would have been knocked down. The architecture of the Weisenhof estate was very new aesthetically, very colourful with flat roofs. The flat roof was completely new for the Stuttgart area. Another striking element was the large windows. The designers were using new, mass-produced, prefabricated elements to make the buildings cheaper for the masses. These modernist architects have a social conscience. They create cheaper housing, which they feel is also liberating. Homes for people to live in radical new ways. What's being expressed here is a reform movement. People wanted to live in more open, freer ways, no longer bound by tradition. It was about being more open, rethinking everything. The large windows were part of it, allowing in a lot of sunlight, all the way inside, to reflect a new attitude to life. The Weisenhof's left-wing international vision of living attracts visitors from around the globe, and they can buy postcards of the buildings. I've brought along my postcards, which I've been collecting for years. Each one has its own story. For many, the Weisenhof's design is too radical, too challenging. Satirical postcards even depict the estate as if it has been lifted out of the Arabian Nights. German visitors write home about their discomfort and confusion. This afternoon, I walked around the exhibition. I can't critique it, because I don't seem to get it. The picture doesn't show military barracks, but houses of the future. For traditionalists, the Weisenhof estate is a threat, not just artistically, but politically. One critic even calls its flat roofs a Jewish Bolshevik design. Cultural turmoil grows in the late 1920s and early 1930s. The Weisenhof's architects, led by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, along with artists such as Picasso and expressionist filmmaker Fritz Lang, are criticized, abused, and even blacklisted. Their radical art and architecture is making many Germans uncomfortable and even afraid. Hitler and the Nazi party exploit these fears of the radical and foreign. They present themselves as the champions of a brave, new and pure German culture. They also use the arts and media to spread their propaganda. Culture was extraordinarily important to National Socialism because they claimed to be a worldview that encompassed everything. They wanted films, they wanted art, they wanted music that were consistent with Nazi ideology. Hitler's views about culture owe a lot to Alfred Rosenberg, an uncompromising traditionalist who had joined the Nazi party before him. Rosenberg hates Jews and communists, partly due to his own experiences. Alfred Rosenberg was a Baltic German. He, of course, had to flee with the Bolshevik Revolution and Lenin's takeover. And this made Rosenberg a bitter enemy of the Russian Bolsheviks and communists. And it was really Rosenberg who introduced to Hitler the idea that communism was controlled by the Jews, that it was a means by which there's a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. As an author and editor, Rosenberg writes passionately about Aryan superiority. He spreads conspiracy theories blaming influential Jews for poisoning and undermining German culture. This, he argues, is the Nazis' most important battleground. In 1929, he creates an organization that takes this battle onto the streets and into art galleries and concert halls, confronting the Nazis' artistic enemies. The Fighting League for German Culture would go around and kind of attack modern, modern works, demand for exhibitions to be closed, 
uh, pour scorn on modernist paintings and, uh, and art and so on, and that had some resonance with Hitler. Rosenberg is successful. His hatred of communists, Jews and non-Aryans profoundly shapes Nazi ideology. Later, it helps define the Nazis' racist vision of architecture, art and culture. The Nazis viewed everything through a racial prism. Jazz music was hated because it was regarded as black, and abstract art was hated because it was regarded as Jewish. The argument you see for a Nazi is that the Jews are trying to sabotage German culture. So it was this idea of an existential threat to Germandom, but it was primarily cultural. They're going to destroy our culture by subverting it. That was the reason. In reality, Jewish artists, musicians and writers are fully integrated into German society and have been for generations. But with society disenchanted and bitter after the First World War, the Nazis play on centuries-old anti-Semitic fears to portray Jews as the enemy within. Nazi propaganda says Jews are polluting the people and a threat to the nation's racial and cultural purity a threat that must be eradicated. If you say, my group is the sum of all good in the world, my group represents the highest aspirations of humankind, so my group's interest is the universal interest, and if anybody threatens my group, they threaten virtue, then I have a warrant for genocide. By destroying them, I'm protecting virtue. And I think that's absolutely central to the Nazi ideology. But first, the Nazis have to take power. In 1933, they do just that when Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. This key victory allows him to make bold changes to Germany's government, gaining total power over the next few months. One of Hitler's earliest changes is to create the Ministry of Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda. Hitler knows exactly who he wants to lead it, to win the nation's hearts and minds for Nazism, and it isn't Rosenberg. Instead, he chooses the much more practical and effective Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels came from a Catholic background in the Rhineland. He fancied himself as an intellectual, and he was regarded as a Nazi radical, and he certainly liked the socialism in National Socialism more than some other Nazis did. I think Hitler realised his um, ambition, his ruthlessness, his talent for propaganda. Möge die helle Flamme unserer Begeisterung niemals zum Erlöschen kommen. Sie allein gibt auf der schöpferischen Kunst einer modernen politischen Propaganda Licht und Vers, das Herz eines Volkes zu gewinnen und es auch zu behalten. Goebbels had proved himself to Hitler serving as Nazi leader in Berlin with his violent, provocative tactics and bold propaganda. Now, his mission is to carry out the same role for the whole of Germany. Goebbels was clearly a very gifted propagandist. He had a way of drumming up issues, of putting things onto the front page, of creating sensations. He was a great media manipulator, and Hitler recognised this. To clear the way for the Nazis' new cultural regime, Goebbels takes part in an intellectual purge. In May 1933, in 19 university towns across the country, Nazi supporters organise mass book burnings. It's called the action against the un-German spirit. Books on philosophy, history, politics, even novels, are hurled into the flames, as well as anything written by or about Jews. The era of an exaggerated Jewish intellectualism is now at an end, and the future German man will not only be a man of the book, but also a man of character. And to this end, we want to educate you. That was a frightening symbol for all of the world. It was a, a crematorium of learning and scholarship, uh, which actually anticipated another kind of crematorium years later. The book burnings are intended to halt modernism and cleanse German society of anything that doesn't fit into Hitler's worldview. The 
the Nazis are closing down the artistic and cultural experiments of the 1920s. Educational institutions were immediately brought into line in 1933. The Bauhaus, for instance, but also art academies. At the same time, professors who were known for supporting the avant-garde movement and teaching it were immediately fired. Jews, for example, are fired from their civil servants' positions. And what's important to realize is that Civil servant or Beamter in German doesn't mean just people sitting in Berlin, you know, running the ministries. It covers universities, it covers a lot of legal officials, it covers teachers, it covers a huge area of German life. Hitler's government passes law after law, dismantling personal freedom piece by piece. The Nazis also use boycotts and bans against Jews and communists. The threat of the concentration camp enables them to take control of German society. There were a lot of independent companies working, of course, and film companies, publishing houses, and many others whose employees were not state employees. And again, it took a bit longer for, for it to happen there, but it happened there in the end too. So this is a massive purge, first of all of Jews, and then secondly of political oppositional figures. Journalists are muzzled, dissenters silenced. The Nazis fill the vacuum with their own news and images. One of the things the Nazis wanted to do was to bring culture to the masses. Their kind of culture, obviously, their image of culture, but still to bring it to the masses. The Nazis are keen to use television for their propaganda, but in the 1930s, the technology is quite primitive and few people own expensive TV sets. So, to get their message into as many German households as quickly and cheaply as possible, the Nazis focus on radio. In 1933, Goebbels takes over the House of Broadcasting, the world's first dedicated broadcasting center and the home of Germany's public radio network. The Nazis now control the airwaves, but only a quarter of German households have a radio set. So Goebbels insists that a cheap radio must be designed and produced at once. Electricity was getting much cheaper because more power stations were coming online, the price was going down, as with all new mass technologies, and so you could get a people's receiver, the Volksempfänger. The party radio was sold at budget discount, and they produced one within nine months of getting to power and an even more bargain one half its size uh, a few years later. Suddenly every family has a smart radio. You had radios in public places in squares. You also had factory radios. You had radios in banks. You had radios in shops. You had radios in restaurants. But to keep out unwelcome ideas, these radios have a crucial limitation. These new sets were fixed so that you couldn't hear foreign broadcasts without, without a great difficulty. The new radio's official name is The People's Receiver, but it is soon nicknamed Goebbels Gob. Goebbels literally owned radio. He has a switch in his office, actually showcased in the media. Look, our great Goebbels, he actually has a switch in his office so he can cut out any program and address you directly. It's an extraordinary symbol of one's power over the message and meaning one kind of media dictator of the country. Transmitting from the House of Broadcasting, thousands of radio employees cover every political event. At their peak, Hitler's speeches can be heard by 90% of Germans. When Hitler gave a speech, it was broadcast on all the radios. Uh, you had to stop work and gather around the radio wherever you worked. But Goebbels knows that a diet of pure propaganda is the best way to make people switch off. He believes it's best to give the people a lot of what they really want alongside party messages to make them more palatable. It was not, emphatically not, uh, screaming, ranting speeches from party officials. Meine Damen und Herren, ich bin romantisch. A very high proportion of broadcasts on these radios were of entertainment programs. It 
if game shows had existed in the time of Nazi Germany, Goebbels would have loved them. Any sort of non-political thing that people enjoy. <laughs> With radio totally in his power, Goebbels now targets the artists directly. Writers, musicians, architects and artists are all forced to sign up with a new government agency, the Reich Chamber of Culture. At first, joining is easy. The admission criteria were set very low so that the entire art community could easily be absorbed into the Reich Culture Chamber, as this was the only sure way for Goebbels to control everybody. So everyone who painted in a modern style was accepted, even Jewish artists. The Reich Chamber of Culture had a lot of subdivisions, the Reich Chamber of Music and Chamber of Art and Literature and all the rest of it film and so on. And uh, this was a compulsory state organization. They also included called art dealers, art gallery directors, all the rest of it. And so in this way, right across the board, Goebbels got control of the entire cultural apparatus of Nazi Germany and everybody who worked in it. Now Goebbels knows the name of everyone in the German art world. Modernist artists like Ernst Kirchner, Otto Dix and Ludwig Gies. German Jewish composers like Arnold Schoenberg. They are all on his register. With this information, Goebbels can wield enormous power over the cultural community. But not yet. We cannot imagine the resurgence of the German people without the resurgence of German culture and, above all, German art. Today, we are performing a symbolic act. October 15th, 1933. Adolf Hitler lays the foundation stone for a new institution that will drive the Nazis' cultural transformation of Germany, an art gallery in Munich called the House of German Art. Hitler wants this building to be a temple to the new Nazi vision of art, so its design has to reflect this. There was an enormous interest in the planners of the building to create a ceremonial space, a space that has a certain kind of aura, that has a certain kind of spatial power. Hitler designs the House of German Art with one of his favorite architects, Paul Troost. Classical styling is combined with modern engineering. The result is a totally new building, absolutely in line with Nazi ideology, reflecting their imagined historical origins. They like the word eternal Germany, the idea that the roots of Germany went back to the distant past, even going back to the Romans and the Greeks. So it was essential that culture be incorporated into the Nazi worldview in ways that suggested Nazism was not a recent development. It was really an ancient tradition come to new expression. It feels pompous and monumental. Bombastic is to do with the expression of power and it's to do with the you know, humiliation of the individual in a way. And so it's, it's all about belittling people and, you know, and impressing you and you know, what's sinister about the architecture of that period and what Hitler wanted to do with it is not the architecture itself, it's the fact that it represents an attitude towards the individual and authority. Hitler's gallery will take four years to build. He wants Germany to be racially and culturally pure by the time his temple to Nazi art opens. In 1935, new anti-Semitic legislation, known as the Nuremberg Laws, is announced. These don't just restrict the political and human rights of Germany's Jews even further, they are the start of a plan to drive Jews out of German cultural life. The moment has come for Goebbels to wield his new powers. 
Many artists, composers, writers and filmmakers have their membership of the Reich Culture Chamber suddenly cancelled. And now, after 1935, every individual member had to re-register with the Reich Culture Chamber. They had to submit an Aryan certificate or proof of ethnic identity. And this is when they began to systematically exclude Jewish artists, as well as those artists who still worked in a modern style. Approved artists are given licenses to continue working under a new registration system. You can't have a license unless you can prove that you have Aryan heritage, so-called. So that's a very effective, brutal but effective mechanism for excluding Jews from the industry. As Goebbels' grip on Germany's artists tightens, modernist paintings disappear from the walls of art galleries. Museum directors who dare to support expressionist art are sacked. Artists who can go abroad flee. Goebbels also wants to control and purify Germany's most popular cultural activity, the cinema. He knows that this is the medium that's going to change hearts and minds. He spots this as a means of ideological manipulation or ideological control. Universe Film Corporation, UFA, is the largest German film production company. Their studios at Babelsberg are still in use today. Here, Goebbels shows UFA executives that he is now effectively their boss. He lectures them about his vision of German film rising to new artistic heights suffused with the Nazi spirit. He talks about the need to create a new film art. Film art that will rival Hollywood, but a film art that will be very specifically German. So no Jews, a lot of more or less subtle anti-Semitism, but also a general repudiation of anything that looks culturally different. The Nazis introduce censorship as early as 1934, but this isn't enough for Goebbels. He wants influence at the very heart of the film industry, while maintaining the appearance of artistic freedom. So Goebbels encourages UFA to set up an artistic committee. Officially, its purpose is to boost German cinema into a world-leading art form. But unofficially, it acts as a proxy for Goebbels' own ideas. It is fascinating reading the minutes of that committee because what you see in microcosm is fascism and a totalitarian regime at work. Because you see people whose careers are on the line, um, they want to make money, they want the studios to be successful and they also want themselves to be promoted. They quote Goebbels extensively and it's by no means without conflict. There is real debate that goes on. Of course, always in, against the background of a regime that rules by terror. Goebbels is determined to find the right filmmaking formula to engage cinema audiences while educating them in the Nazi way of thinking. He realizes that he needs to understand how people respond to films. The Nazis had their own forms of market research, but specifically with films, there was ticket sales. But the other was to have observers in the audience, and they could tell if a German film was being hissed, which they sometimes were. From the mid-1930s, the secret police are everywhere. They're going into public places, listening, reporting back on the state of public opinion. Goebbels refers to them very often in his diaries, and they do tell a fascinating story of what's going on in the cinemas. Goebbels came rapidly to the conclusion that the key art of propaganda was to embed it in entertainment. And, and that is the insight, the genuinely original insight, which he has. It's the propaganda of disguise. Under Goebbels' control, German cinema is effectively nationalized but it also flourishes. More films with better quality and popular themes draw bigger audiences and even win international acclaim. 
there are exotic adventures, there are musical comedies, there are comedies, there are melodramas, and they target different audiences and they capture people in different ways. And it seems to me that that is really what certainly the early years of National Socialism are about. They're about laying the ground for the increasing reign of terror of the National Socialists. They're about creating consent amongst a population that is learning to live with National Socialism and that doesn't need to see images of terror. What it needs to see is that something new and good is happening. So, cinema goers in Nazi Germany and abroad see a highly edited version of reality. They wanted to project the feeling, the sense, the look of a modern Western country. It shouldn't look like a totalitarian dictatorship. It shouldn't feel like that to the people who lived there. It's actually wonderfully subtle as a form of mind manipulation. Spring 1937, Hitler's House of German Art is nearly complete. The moment has come to define the new Nazi vision of art, but this is no easy task. There have been constant arguments about what was German art, massive arguments about should we show expressionist art or should we show more traditional 19th century German art. The Nazi party is split into two factions. Back to basics, traditionalists like Rosenberg want conventional figurative art, heroic people and striking landscapes. Progressives like Goebbels prefer the bold, abstract images of the expressionists. Each side is desperate to win Hitler's personal endorsement. Even within the Nazi party, there were many who defended Expressionism. Both Expressionism and Expressionist artists were regarded and defended by them as being essentially German art. But it is widely known that personally, the Führer is no fan of Expressionism. Hitler tried to be an artist and he'd failed with his painstakingly pedantic representations of buildings and scenes, expressionist paintings, uh, colorful, vivid, alive, but not particularly representational. And Hitler thought, why are these people succeeding with this rubbish when I failed? Hitler appoints a jury to choose works for the first great German art exhibition. They present 800 works for his approval, but they are not to the Führer's taste. When Adolf Hitler came to look at the first selection in the spring of 1937, he flew into a rage and tore painting after painting off the walls because they were still much too modern by his standards. It seems only one man can decide what is allowed inside the Führer's house of German art, Hitler himself. He fires the jury and makes a new selection just in time for the opening in July 1937. The first great German art exhibition was not only to launch the building to this temple of German art, as Hitler called it, but also to put a stamp on the kind of iconography of the Nazis' imagination of, of the Reich. The purpose was really to inscribe Hitler's personal vision of art. The final selection of artworks was in line with the officially approved artistic ideal. This means themes of war, glorification of man as a warrior, glorification of woman as a mother, and nurturer of the German nation. The curatorial conception of Hitler during this period would have been not necessarily about the quality of the art, about the, the formal aspects of it, but more on the imagery. It was just simply pure propaganda. Hitler fills 40 rooms with nearly 900 landscapes, portraits and sculptures. The Nazi vision of art is now clear. 
the House of German Art is packed with strong, simple, representational and naturalistic artworks, with the occasional classical pastiche. Adolf Wissel's paintings of idealised farming life hang next to Adolf Ziegler's neoclassical nudes. Weakness, disease and doubt are all banished. A superficial beauty dominates. Hitler's favourite sculptor, Arno Brecker, creates muscle-bound male nudes. Aryan supermen in stone. National Socialist Germany wants art that is once again German art, and it will be an art that lasts forever, as all of the creative values of the nation will last forever. Hitler's intent was to introduce a new imagery, a new iconography that elevated the people, that brought the vision of this wholesome society more clearly to the public. This statement of intent obviously had a Mr. Dimension, which was the destruction of the progressive forces that were pitching a completely new vision of what modern art ought to be. Hitler was going to clean house in the domain of culture as he had done in the domain of politics. For four years, a civil war has raged for the artistic soul of Germany. But when the public first step inside the House of German Art, it becomes clear that the supporters of modernism, including Joseph Goebbels, have just lost. Consequently, after those four years had passed in 1937, the definitive destructive blow against modern art was executed. And at this point, Joseph Goebbels started playing the part of an opponent of modernism, taking over leadership of the campaign of defamation. Goebbels soon swallows his personal enthusiasm for modernism. Now he enthusiastically names and shames the art that offends the newly defined Nazi sensibility. By special order of the Führer, a commission was sent throughout Germany's museums to confiscate offending works of art. Within a very short period of time, almost 700 artworks were seized and taken to Munich. Works by Picasso, Cézanne, Van Gogh and Gauguin are confiscated and displayed in an exhibition of degenerate art in Munich, alongside German expressionists such as George Gross, Ernst Kirchner, Otto Dix and Ludwig Gies. It opens in the Archaeological Institute the day after the start of Hitler's exhibition in the House of German Art, just across the road. Goebbels speaks of the opening, condemning the featured art. His cynical transformation from expressionist lover to bitter opponent of modernism does not go unnoticed. His rival, the arch-traditionalist Alfred Rosenberg, happily crows about Dr. Goebbels dissembling in his diary. And now Dr. G was forced to speak against the incompetence in Munich when it was his representatives who had been defending them for four years. He behaved, as usual, as if he had been the true leader in the fight against artistic degeneration all along. The Nazis present the degenerate art as badly as possible. Hardly any light was allowed into these rooms, so it was basically impossible for these artworks to come across well. They were literally shown in a bad light. This criticism was increased even more by painting derogatory slogans on the walls to shape the visitor's opinion of the art. Over 3,000 people a day visit Hitler's bland exhibition at his House of German Art. But the exhibition of degenerate art attracts 20,000 visitors a day. They come to be scandalized and outraged. Busloads of Nazis were taken in from the countryside, had never been to an art exhibition before, and uh, they were there standing, jeering at it and making faces, which is, of course, part of the exhibition in a way. The exhibition tours Germany's major cities and is seen by a million people, 
The aim is to explain to the nation what makes degenerate art unacceptable. Anything depicted that deviated from its life model was viewed as degenerate, and the same applied to unrealistic color schemes. Any work of art by a Jewish artist was considered degenerate. This is how they tried to define more clearly what they were against. Since Hitler has now decided which art is acceptable, there is no longer any need for art criticism. So Goebbels bans it. Reviewers are instructed to focus only on whether an artwork conforms or not. Artists themselves are given no choice, either conform or stop producing art. It was bigger than just a, a ban on certain artists. You couldn't even make modern art for your own delectation in the privacy of your own home. You weren't allowed to paint abstraction, period which is as totalitarian as they come. Many artists simply went into inner exile. They tried to avoid attention, not to provoke, and shut themselves away. And then, of course, there were those artists who emigrated. Jewish artists had to emigrate, and there were also many politically persecuted artists. At a stroke, degenerate art has been demonized, critics made redundant, and German art largely purified of its unwanted elements. The opening of Hitler's House of German Art in 1937 also establishes a new annual event, the Day of German Art. It features grand parades and exhibitions of new Nazi-approved artworks, all glorifying Nordic myths and military strength. The aim is to make sure the German people know that Hitler and the Nazis are the true guardians of German culture. The point was that the arts are critical to civilization and a critical way of distinguishing Nazi Germany from other countries, specifically America, which they regarded as the anti-culture. And therefore, they wanted to show how cultured they was. They was as a source of power and distinction and as a way of branding the regime. It was all part of the cultural obsession, which is made central to Nazism as a brand, uh, as an ideology. In 1939, the war in Europe has begun. As the German army seizes ever more territory, Alfred Rosenberg realizes it's a huge opportunity. The Nazis began to collect artworks from the countries that they conquered. Gestapo just went into an art collector and then took the stuff off the walls. Rosenberg heads a task force to steal cultural treasures from private, mainly Jewish, collectors from across Europe and bring them back to Germany. So Alfred Rosenberg headed west in 1940, straight after the occupation of the Western Territories. This is where he set up the task force Reich Leader Rosenberg, which grew into the biggest ever art theft outfit. Publicly, this mass theft is portrayed as artistic research or a noble campaign to save vulnerable artworks. But in his diaries, Rosenberg reveals his true motivation. In Paris on the morning of the 28th, I inspected the Jewish artifacts and artworks confiscated by my operational staff in France. Rothschild, Weil, Seligman, etc. had had to give up the fruit of a hundred years' worth of stock market profiteering. Rembrandt, Rubens, Vermeer, Boucher, Fragonard, Goya, etc., etc. were all represented in great number. Ancient carvings, tapestries, etc. The appraisers estimate the value to be nearly one billion marks. Rosenberg's men steal 30,000 art objects from Jewish homes and collections in France and Belgium. As the war rages on, the Nazis take full control of the film industry, radio, the press, music and the theatre. 
But by 1943, the war is going badly for Germany. Joseph Goebbels is struggling to maintain morale at home. During the last phases of the war, the propaganda expenditures kept steadily declining. Several reasons for that. First, the Nazis simply didn't have the resources. They'd sent a lot of their propagandists to the front lines. In fact, Nazi publications for propagandists regularly had the obituaries of former speakers, former propagandists who died here or there on the war fronts. But Goebbels knows the show must go on. He orders Ufa, Germany's biggest film studio, to keep making movies even after some of their studios are destroyed in bombing raids. Escapism is what the people need. The cinema comes up as a place of refuge. It was not only a place of safety, but it was also a place where you could lose yourself, where you could actually go somewhere else for a couple of hours. So what's wanted is a big prestige color spectacle. So in 1943, you have a film like Munchausen. It's a big fantasy spectacular. It's a color film. It's a funny film. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with fascist ideology. One can argue about that, but it's a fantasy adventure. Back in reality, the Nazis' own adventure is running out of time. Bombing raids are becoming ever more frequent. Goebbels orders cinemas to open as soon as possible after raids To protect the film industry, Goebbels and Hitler draw up a list of cinema talent, so-called God-gifted artists who are exempt from frontline duty. They wanted to preserve the very best artists they had. These were all artists that could be depended upon to be productive in ways consistent with Nazi ideology. But by the winter of 1944, even God-gifted artists could no longer be spared by the military. Goebbels' stars of the silver screen were now a luxury the Nazis could not afford. The end comes swiftly. In April 1945, the Soviet army enters Berlin. Film production at Ufa's Babelsberg Studios finally comes to a halt. The Soviets also capture the House of Broadcasting, just a week after it had announced Hitler's suicide. Many of Germany's other buildings were destroyed during the war, but examples of Nazi architecture can still be seen today, some remain in use, with their sinister origins looming over them. Ironically, the Wiesenhof estate in Stuttgart survived the war. This modernist icon resisted both Allied bombing and a Nazi plan to destroy it. Eigentlich sollte hier auf das Gelände ein they actually wanted to build an army headquarters on this site, but then the headquarters was transferred to Strasbourg and the war, thank God, went differently to what they had expected, so the demolition never took place. Therefore, it's pure coincidence, or rather fate, that it survived. But the Nazis had always regarded it as the disgrace of Stuttgart. Now, the Wiesenhof estate is the pride of Stuttgart, housing a museum celebrating modernist architecture. Hitler's House of German Art also survives. It's an art gallery once more, with a special weight of history resting on its columns. Insofar as a building being guilty, I've oftentimes said that buildings have no subjectivity. You can't put them on trial. While you know, it is important to think about a building and its legacy, it nevertheless remains you know, an inanimate thing. It's architecture. No longer limited to German art, the building is now just the house of art. Hitler's art collection has long been replaced with the kind of challenging international works that the Nazis tried to eliminate. 
The building's portico displays the artwork, the joys of Yiddish. We have to continue to, in a sense, denazify the building through the acts of disobedience uh, against the strictures placed on the building in terms of the art that it formerly hosted. That's part of our reflection on the legacy and the history of a building and this place in Munich and Germany. In the end, the Nazis' cultural war came to nothing. The artworks Hitler selected to represent his new Nazi vision of art are now derided as unsophisticated kitsch and remain hidden away. Alfred Rosenberg's ideas have been discredited. His vast stash of looted art was confiscated. Efforts continue to restore them to their rightful owners or their descendants. But many artworks stolen by the Nazis are missing, either destroyed, hidden in private collections, or lost within museums. And as for Joseph Goebbels, perhaps his winning formula of mixing propaganda with entertainment remains the Nazis' most potent and sinister legacy.